Yeah, I always had this dream, sort of a childhood dream. Originally wanting to be a diesel mechanic to one day own my own truck. For what I was going to do, I had no idea, but um, ended up becoming a butcher. So I always reckon your, your life's planned out for you. This is the Australian Butcher's Guild Podcast. Brought to you by Meat and Livestock Australia. The podcast for passionate butchers. G'day meat lovers and welcome to the Australian Butcher's Guild Podcast. I'm your host, Doug Piper. I hope you've all been pretty busy and been able to manage to catch up with some of our podcasts and hopefully you're getting some valuable tips and info from the guests we've had on so far. In this episode, I'm catching up with Western Australian butcher, Larry Brewer, and he's going to talk to us about how his passion for butchery and trucks has all became a reality for him. And now it's over to Brett Thomas with all the Australian Butchers Guild news. Thanks, Doug. Brett Thomas here with all the latest news from the Australian Butchers Guild. June 19 saw the launch of the Beef at Your Best campaign, reminding Australians how beef plays a key role in ensuring we can all be at our best, no matter who we are. Beef at Your Best will get more Australian households to consider beef as an essential part of their healthy meal repertoire by showing how including beef with its many nutritional benefits is the key for Australians being at their best. Beef is the most consumed red meat and helps keep our bodies healthy because it's a great source of protein, iron and B12 in one simple delicious package. The number two reason consumers consider reducing meat consumption is due to health concerns. We want to ensure these consumers are well informed that eating beef in a balanced diet is beneficial to their health. Centred around General Assistant Lance, a key member of the Brisbane Broncos staff and affectionately known as the General, the mockumentary style campaign supports the idea that in a high performance environment, Everyone needs to be on top of their game, regardless of whether they're a professional athlete or part of the extended squad. Lance credits his ability to be at his best to the role beef plays in his and the team's diet. Nutritionally, it's packed with protein for muscle development, a great source of B12 to keep his mind sharp, and iron for sustained energy. The 10-week advertising campaign will appear on national TV and feature across path to purchase, out of home, online video, and social platforms. Finally, a health-focused influencer partnership will showcase how how beef helps everyday Australians be at their best every day. Content will showcase delicious, healthy beef meals for the family, meals to meet specific nutritional needs like high protein or iron and workout ideas for a healthy lifestyle. The campaign is in market until August 28. And finally... Did you know Queensland is the major beef producing state? It's where 45% of the herd is located, 47% of cattle are processed, 62% of grain fed cattle are located. The rebuild of 2020 and 21 has been driven by New South Wales and Victoria as Queensland hasn't been as wet as the southern states over the last two years. The weather in Queensland this year will have a significant impact on cattle prices and supply throughout the season. And that's the latest from the Australian Butchers Guild newsroom. Back to you, Doug. Thanks, Brett. Now, Larry's going to talk to us about the highs and lows of selling his baby the Star of the North Butcher Shop in Currabye in Western Australia, and then go on to tackle some of Australia's most isolated and remote regions selling fresh meat in a 22-wheel mobile butcher shop. How's that? Not many guys can do that. Let's catch up with Larry. Nice to see you. Been a while. It has, mate. I was trying to think the last time I would have seen you was... uh I reckon probably 10 years, maybe. Yeah, it was, I'm just trying to think. With the truck we had in um, Kings Park, we had the Sausage King. I don't know if you were over for then. Yep. Mr McPherson at the time. I, I remember the thing, but I wasn't there. I, I remember hearing about it, how you two um, got up to a little bit of mischief. Oh, well, Mr Gary, yes. What can, what can you say? <laughs> it's not hard with him, mate. Not hard with him. No, uh, but no, all good, thanks. Yeah. Good stuff. Hey, mate, how long have you been in the industry for? Yeah, well, gee, if you go right back, probably about 44 years now. I've ventured out a little bit this day and age, gone down a different path, but, uh, yeah, but in the, the meat game, still uh, involved, doing a bit of consultancy work over here in the west, okay. in Perth. But, um, yeah, when it's needed, I um, put my hand up, so I'm pretty passionate about it. So if time permits, if you can put some input in with, um, with the people around the place, a lot that you still know. I think it's, uh, it's all good. You were working in the boat shed butchery, weren't you? Or you were managing it or something? No, well, right from the early days there. I worked in Claremont for quite a few years. And then um, went down to uh, Napoleon Street, okay. which is in uh, Cottesloe, um, near the boat shed. A meat chain over here, Five Star Meats. Just managed that store, just briefly. And then um, managed that store for three and a half years. And then thought about buying a shop. And then um, went into partnership with one of the owners. And then consequently, we were going to buy 
one of their stores, but the boat shed was for sale. And uh, so we ended up buying that. Yeah, that was uh, welcome to seven days a week trading back then, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, a special permit for trading long weekends and weekends. So uh, that was the start of my being in business for myself uh, back in the boat shed, yes. Okay. Yep. I remember going to that shop many years ago um, with old Rafa on one of the Red Meat networking tours. So were you were you running that then, or we took over that business at the boat shed probably mid ninety seven. That's when we uh, took ownership, and then um, yeah, I, I was in partnership there, uh, and that was a leg up for me from being just a manager to being uh, your own um, your own destiny as your own your own business. So mm -hmm. fortunately, it was a, a going concern. Had a good reputation as it was, so we didn't change much. We just kept things as they were, and then. It, Slowly just introduced your little ways or new ideas, but when something's uh, not broken, you know, you leave it. So, uh, yeah, that was, um, you could have been with RAF, I'm not sure, but that was when it was only 35 square metres. So we sort of got the reputation of working in small areas. So um, and then down the line, yeah, that, that uh, a future journey in another store, Star of the North. I was a bit confused there because I, I know the boat shed turned out to be an absolute fantastic butcher shop. That, that was where, was it, Australia 2 was built? Is that the same one? Yes, you, you're spot on. Yeah, originally that was a, uh, a boat building workshop and Australia 2 was built there. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've still got photos, like today, um, photos on the wall of it uh, coming out on a, on a big um, low loader truck back in the days. But, yeah, hats off to those boys that started that because they, they didn't have much and they, they did it sort of on the cheap. Um, but if you go there of today... Far out. It's one of the best best places in Australia to for food. Yeah, I, I think I went. I think we went there around. I think it would have been about two thousand and eight or two thousand and nine. Would have been around about the time that we went there with the RMNC tour. And, and I remember going in there. And I'd never seen anything like that before. You know, it was just such a well drilled shop um, from right from from product placement for presentation and and then. The, uh, the just the, the ticketing. One one of my big biggest things is tickets. Most butchers, I can't say all butchers, but a lot of butchers like me have got rubbish handwriting. You know, very very scrappy. But these guys, they they had it down pat. They had all their tickets all done on the computer, and they had a cooking. They had the cooking instructions and everything. You know, and I really, you know, I just sort of thought, wow, this is this is the place to come and or to tell butchers to go and have a look at this shop. Yeah. Um you're spot on there. Yeah, the ticketing is so important because uh, oh, when we ta start talking about efficiencies in, in the shops um, and back to the tickets, you know, you've got uh, people shop with their eyes and I suppose you look at a tray of meat, the first thing you look at is the ticket. But then being efficient, if you have, even if you've got shitty handwriting, yep. um, if you get the same person, person in, in the store doing the tickets, which I used to get one of my apprentices to do that, that was his job. And funny enough, he had reasonable handwriting. So his job in, in the store was, um, you know, need a new ticket, off he goes and, and does it. Yeah, it's only the little, the little tiny things that, that make up the last 10% of the overall picture of, um, of the business. Such an important part too, isn't it? It is, so much, yep. The Star of the North, mate, you started that from scratch or was that an existing butcher shop or what? No, that was um, sort of step two from... Boat shed, probably the first, I don't know, 20 plus years, was always working down um, the western suburbs there. So I wanted to move closer to home up uh, north of the river in Carabine or uh, at the time where we lived. And uh, yeah, Star of the North, that was at a little local, local shopping centre. And uh, I was at work one day on a Sunday. I used to work Sundays. My wife rang me and said, you won't believe it, the, um, the ice cream shop at Carabine Marketplace has shut down and it had a four lease sign up uh, at the front. So I said to my wife, Leanne, get me the number, will you? Which I had, you know, just sowing a seed, I could um, maybe create a new butcher shop in the old ice cream shop. So they went broke. And um, again, it was only at the time then, I think about 60 square metres. So it was double the size of the boat shed at the time. So yeah, I made the call on the Monday morning and I got the leasing agent and um, she knew of the boat shed. She reckons I served her when she came to the counter. So she knew me. Teed up a meeting and, um, yeah, done a deal with them. Um, and they really wanted us there to have, have a butcher. I think in negotiations, you know, you just be yourself and 
don't be a smarty pants or, or expect the world. And uh, and this was um, Fabcot Industries, which is um, Woolworths at the time, that owned the shopping centre. So I was dealing with Woolworths. So all this was sort of a, a learning curve for myself and I've just taken it on board over the years and that sort of understanding of um, doing business and just be level-headed and, you know, it will get you places. So if I can express my ideas or uh, experiences, you know, and share it with people out there, by all means, um, there's still opportunities. So, yeah, so anyway, we, um, my partner bought, bought my share out at the boat shed and... Um, we, uh, we created the um, Star of the North, which, like any, and I read it in some of the meat magazines recently, um, people starting new stores from nothing, and, yeah, it's, a, it's not an easy task, and, uh, and that, that shop wasn't either. You know, it took us about two years to get it working, not cranking, but get it working. And it was really understanding the demographics of the area you're in and what style you do, and looking back then to what and way shops are now, you know, there's a big change, but it's all good. You just got to understand what people want. But once we got it going, really focused on customer service. That is the most biggest thing I think um, for the butcher. What I'm doing now, I still, you know, I'm in transport now, but I, I transport a lot of meat, so I always go to the butcher and have a look, and I just stand back and listen to way Johnny there serving Mrs Brown at the counter and just his mannerism and whatnot. And a couple of times you feel like jumping in and saying something, but majority of the time, it's it's fair to say that you know. Generally, people do a pretty good job, and I think it's lucky for the retail industry now. You've got such an opportunity there because of all this COVID stuff and customer service. I know we've been saying that for years, but I think you know, like we used to have the workshop nights with um, RNMC, um, used to focus on that a bit with the um, um, customer service and even though prepping different dishes or whatever you're talking about that night or creating, you know, you can on sell it for, through. Just talking and being yourself and education, learning experiences from other people. Customer service is such like, and we we've hit on it a few times here on the podcast. And you know, we it's a long day in a butcher shop, as as we all know, and uh, everyone's got various challenges. You know, both at work and at home, and you, you've got to you've got to leave them at the door, and you've got to when the customer comes in, you you've got to be on your game because you know that's what keeps them coming back, and and that's that's a big thing. For, for customers these days to, is is to feel comfortable to walk into the shop they're not going to hear your life story but you know sometimes they've got issues too you know and they've, they've they like to vent to their butcher you know I, I couldn't you know some of the stories we've all heard are, and you know you and I aren't alone you know we're old dinosaurs at this and you know we I bet you know we've heard some fantastic stories over the years and and they're like a lot of other butchers around the place too we, we just got to be that shoulder to cry on so to speak and listen to them and you give them a little bit of advice like you know we're not we're not there to solve their problems we're there to sell them meat but you know at the end of the day as long as you get that that sale and you, the customer walks out nice and happy and you know nine times out of ten they're going to come back and hopefully next time they'll come back with a different you know without those problems and they'll be thankful that you've sold them for them even if you haven't given them any advice advice all you've done is listen and uh you know that's part of the customer service of, of being in the front line with with consumers yeah for sure i mean and, you know, the first two years, like I said, at, at Star of the North, um, we, we sensed that. And um, my manager there, a lot of guys remember him, James, um, big, thick-set fella. We focused on that and put a lot of energy into talking points and, you know, making time to chat with them. And to be honest, you know, after a couple of years, that really coming to the shop of uh, that's why people came there because and then we trained, you know, had a couple of apprentices there and we had... You know, I had, a, I had a real good uh, core bunch of uh, guys over the 11 years that we were there. And, um, yeah, that, that really grew the business as the customer service was the focus. You know, everyone just got to know the people's names and all that. And then if you fast forward, I know we'll get to that, but being on the um, – after this shop, you know, we had the, the mobile one in the Pilbara region of WA. And um, once again, oh, you know, what, what an eye-opener that was with, you know, travelling – Five six hundred kilometres through the night to another little town community customer base, and they all want to tell you what, about their woes and what's going on in town and what's new. And yeah, it's quite bizarre. But back to the core, that customer service. You, you, you know, if you can win them over, you've got them for life, basically. Treat them with respect and, and like like you care. So 
Yeah, that was a, a big thing. Yeah, it's it's a it's a funny thing. You you really don't know. We don't a hundred percent know the power of the customer. We know they've got the power to drop you like a like a you know rotten tomato at the drop of a hat, but they can also help you out a lot. I, I remember my last shop. We we just ended up walking out of that. It just wasn't making any money. We were we were really struggling. Costs were going up, and and competition was coming in from um from the big chains. And I remember bumping into one of my old customers who who she was just a normal customer, just used to come in two or three times a week, buy a mince, whatever else she'd buy. Was was you know a, a reasonably good friend to talk to as well. Anyway, I bumped into her at the shops probably about a year after we we'd got out of the shop, and she said, "Ah, oh, what what happened? You know, like you, you should have told us what the problem was because." Basically, they made me feel bad because I felt like I'd let down the whole community there. It's it's a, it's a power that you have that you don't know how strong that power is, but you, you can influence people by just being yourself and being normal and, and being a friendly person. You know, that gets you so much respect and, and that made me feel really good that at least these people respected what I did, how I... I all I did was sell them meat, you know. I wanted them to come back, you know, and um, you know, it, it sort of it was a really nice feeling at the end of the day. It's a crucial part of as being that person there to listen to people because you you'll get that back in in tenfold. Yeah, I think that's the how a butcher is sort of represented in, in what I've sensed as well. You know, um, just through reading or talking to other people, your, your own things that are going on. But you're spot on, yes. And again, yeah, we'll talk about the the meat truck itself. And uh, even today, I still go to see Danny, I sh- who bought the shop off me in Carambine. I just spoke to him this afternoon. Funny enough. Mm. Well, if MLA, you know, some workshop nights. There's an idea for you, Doug. You know, just customer service from maybe there's a, a few blokes around that could offer that. Just little tips. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just what, like you said, then you know, you you're just doing selling meat, but people respect it with your honesty and. The way you talk so that might just be a couple little things for people watching this now that would um uh, take on board uh, but if they can get some probably ideas from people that have been around for a while yeah it, it goes a long way i mean we never stop learning you know it doesn't matter who we talk to Mate, one of my favorite sayings you never stop learning <laughs> you did right yeah you, you hit on demographics before um when you when you first open up star of the north and we we had a um, we've got a program we've still got access to it uh, called the Helix Personas, which we we in conjunction with Amic we we uh, we we had Amic out there using that program for their for their members and and actually for non members as well, and it was a valuable business tool where we could drill into a community like an area we'd set an area around say the Star of the North around Currambine. Uh, say we did a five kilometer radius and we could tell you out of this out of this program we could tell you what was the most purchased protein in that area over the last seven days uh we could or we could tell you the ethnicity the income the age brackets whether they were ha- house proud people or whether they were the, the family side of it there was just so much information in this program and it was such a fantastic business tool. And a lot of butchers actually used it. And it even it gave you insights into whether it's worthwhile doing online butchery, like online shopping in your area. So if you were thinking about maybe doing that whole online thing, mate, we could tell you how many people are currently shopping using using online services but the, it, it travels across everything, like it travels across supermarkets as well as non-supermarkets, which is butcher shops. So it's a, it's a great tool. Yeah, anyone listening, yeah, with that, they should uh, own into it for sure, that one. So, mate, after Star of the North, you you have a passion for trucks. Yes, ever since a little boy, I can say. So um, at Star of the North, I, I, probably a lot of people already know the story, but the ones that don't, just briefly, I was just serving a lady one day, at Carambine, we catered for a lot of, we call it the international meat specialist because the demographics, you know, you had, you had English, the Scots, Welsh, Irish, South Africans, lot the works. So we catered for all their different uh, wares and um, I was serving a lady at the counter and she bought quite a bit and again, just that conversation with the butcher and I said, oh gee, you're buying a bit? She said, oh, I'm going back home. And I said, oh, where's home? She's oh, Caratha. And I said, oh, really? I said, you've got a bit of a drive. So, um, she said, I've got something that might interest you. And uh, I said, what's that? And she said, oh, well, 
every fortnight we have a fish truck come to Karatha and um, it's, he sells his seafood, frozen, uh, all packaged, you know, 500 gram packs basically, out the back of the truck and at the Shell Roadhouse in Karatha and um, she said people are just queued up, you know, big long line. So I said, can you do me a favour? I said, can you send me a few photos, And which she did and uh, off she went on a merry way. So um, I went back to a bench and started cutting the steaks or whatever I was doing. I thought, you know what, I could sell meat and be on the road in a truck. So that's where the idea come from. And um, oh gee, I look back now, I think, holy crap, what were you, what were you thinking? And uh, so I went to work and thought, right, what can I do? So I went to Small Business Development Corporation in, uh, in Joondalup, just around the corner from Currambine, met with someone, told them what I wanted to do which was, you know, like a, a mobile retail shop as a butcher on the road. And he says, well, where do you want to go? And I said, well, in the Pilbara. So he said, you've been there before? I said, mm, not really. So he said, the best thing you can do is get in your car and go for a drive. I think I went three times. Me and Liam went once. Uh, and then I took a, a close friend of mine, uh, like a long life friend. We used to work together, Andy, Andrew Bonnell. Consequently, he just sold his business at the same time I sold Star of the North. So we did a trip together, and I always listen to Andrew with um, business sense. Uh, there's that thing about you never stop learning, and um, we um, we took off. So we did a couple of runs just to figure out where I was going to go, and um, yeah, where we we're going to park, getting permits, all that. I mean, I look back now, it was, it was it was a huge effort, and then you know, buying a truck, buying a trailer, fitting it out, parking it, you know, where I'm going to cut the meat. So. I sold Star of the North to Daniel, who's still got it today. He's just ticked over 11 years, no, 10 years. So young Daniel was my clean-up boy and then apprentice, and he qualified as a butcher, and uh, he used to be like a 2IC manager when me or James went away. Young Daniel, he always stepped up to the plate. He'd never say no. Consequently, now he, he bought, it, bought the shop with his mum and dad from myself, and um, he's still there today. And that was 2011. I had a year off to build and plan this truck, mobile shop. It actually took three years from the day that lady came in the store to actually doing the first trip. Wow. I take my own hat off for that. You know, it was a mammoth effort. So between me, my son over here, Ryan, you know, he was a big input with it, with all the IT stuff, creating the websites and creating the Facebook, being in touch with me when we're on the road with the Facebook and posting up when, when we're going to be in town and all that jazz. It was a huge effort. Uh, we finally hit the road and um, yeah, again, it was a learning curve. Um, mm. And that neck of the woods, maybe some of your viewers m might watch Outback Truckers. A lot of people have watched it. And that, go that was a great insight of us um, being on the road and what we do and just the environment we're going into, you know, probably three quarters of the year. It is just hot, like hot, hot, hot. We were, here we are up there, you know, trying to sell probably one of the most perishable Lincoln items, you know, that's going and, um, yeah, and putting up with the elements and everything else. But I must say um, I wanted to create something that was bulletproof after viewing the, the fish truck. Yeah. And I wanted to get people from outside. I wanted them inside so it's a bit more pleasant. And the idea behind that was to, you know, they, they, they feel not hot and out of the flies and the dust and the dirt and everything else and more relaxed so... They got time and, and it was set up as a self-serve sort of shop, which we would you know, slice a, a porterhouse or um, cut a whole rump up or bone out the leg of lamb or whatever for them. But majority of the time it was, was self-serve. So yeah, a bit more relaxed. So they take their time and fill up their baskets. Yeah, we did that once a month, that, that trip. Bit of a lifestyle thing, plus servicing uh, remote community towns in the Pilbara. The furthest we went was um, Port Hedland. And again, it was a different business model that had never been done before. It's not like buying a, a rundown butcher shop where you've got something to work with. Um, this was just out of the blue. And um, I haven't had many bosses over my butchering career. I've, you know, I've sort of a bit of a stale walk and staying, staying in the same place. And, and you know him, Doug, uh, Greg McConaughey at Karen Up. Yep. Yeah, he was a bit of a one of my mentors um, towards the end there. And um, when I finished Arlen North, I... Um, I wanted a year off from not working at Christmas, and I thought, oh, no Christmases to deal with. But Greg rang me and said, would you mind coming in just to do the orders for Christmas? I said, oh, okay. So just before Christmas, I said, I've got something to show you. And um, back then it was 
all the plans and what I was going to do. He knew I was doing something. Anyway, I just laid it on the back room bench out the back when we finished and, you know, having a beer. And I laid it out on the bench, on the butcher table and I said, I'm going to do this. And he's just shaking his head at me. And he said, you got bigger balls than me. One of the, I suppose, sheer, uh, sheer joys of doing the meat truck was actually taking Greg on a, on a trip with us after about, oh, I think it was about four years, I think. Um, he actually come on a run with us. And, uh, yeah, he was just blown away, you know, after me explaining what I was going to do and how I was going to do it and actually doing a trip with us, you know, driving through the dead of night and dodging cattle and stinking hot and setting up ramps every day and moving to another town. And there was another uh, guy I bought the boat shed off, Casey Elsimer. He was, he's retired now, but um, he came about three times because uh, one of the butchers needed time off or whatever. He would always fill in. He said, yep, yeah, I'll come with you. And he was probably the second person that I told what I was going to be doing. So, yeah, so that was, um, again, a big learning curve. We had to tweak it over time. So we, we, we uh, played around with the run and the, our time slots. We gave, you know, a couple of towns away because it just wasn't warranted. So we found mostly the little remote towns, a classic place, a place called Panawanica, which is between Carnarvon and Caratha, mm. a mining town. It's a closed town, which means it's sort of run by the, uh, one of the mines, uh, one of the, the big miners, I think it's BHP or Rio Tinto. And um, they wouldn't let us come in, but in the end I thought, effort, I'm going in there. And uh, what we used to turn over in like three hours, just unbelievable, you know, and with, a, with a, a, a small population, but they knew that the butcher was coming. And we always got told that they, where their treat for the month, they'd come and stock up, you know, in a big way. But um, again, it was that, I suppose, feeling warranted and meaningful for the town folk. And, you know, we used to sell some exotic stuff in like chicken feet, mountains of pet food and, yeah, stuff that they were brought up on back when they were, you know, kids, I suppose. And here they can buy it out in the remotest, you know, part of Western Australia off the back of a truck. So, yeah, it's pretty pretty chuffed of servicing those those places. And, uh, yeah, being on the road, it was a, a, a big journey over, over per trip. It was about 4,500 kilometres over nine days. So the truck was our, um, our home for the month, uh, every month for a week. But we were pretty set up, you know, we were pretty self-contained and had a couple of issues with different things. But, you know, once you have an issue, you can solve it. Oh, that's what I've found going forward, being in business and now venturing into transport. Um, that's an eye-opener as well. But, you know, just last night I was, I was down south of Perth and it was absolutely buckling with rain and, oh, do I stay in the truck and get out because I don't hook trailers? And then I had a small misfunction with the, with the lights so, and it's normally the plug. So you know, you know where to find and how to solve problems. I was there by myself, so you got to deal with it. These life experiences will come and hit you anywhere, at any place, at any time, and it's no different in a butcher shop or whatever. So you just deal with it. That's a great story about what you've done there. And and for those of you that have probably haven't seen Aussie Truckers or Australian Outback Truckers, whatever they call the program. We're not talking about a little refrigerated truck, are we, Larry? We're talking, was it 22-wheeler or something like that? Yeah, 20, uh, 45 foot. Um, but, yeah, after I, I did all sorts of scenarios with Ryan, my son here. Funny enough, he told me what to do. So I went with his gut feeling. <laughs> and lucky for him, it worked. <laughs> and he's just in the background listening to me here. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but he was right. He said, Dad... And when it comes to the truck, you know, it was, um, I thought about doing a van with a ton of trailer and all that, but it's a hell of a long way and um, it would have warranted, you know, um, for what you would have turned over to adventure that far, a uh, return trip, it just would have warranted. And um, mm. we got asked a few times, and again, here we go, listening to our customers, um, oh, you should come every two weeks. But it wouldn't warrant it because they wouldn't spend as much. So we, are, we stuck to once a month. Mm. Um, and then just getting the right configuration of what was going to work. And my focus was to, after going up there and in the mid middle of summer, when in downtown Port Hedland that day, it was like 46 degrees in the sun, you've got to be prepared for it. So my thinking was, well, I want to buy the best trailer that would suit and get people out of the elements, create a pleasant environment, give them lots of options. So we had all that. It was, you know, big cabinets, oodles, if it, you know, our product list was, was massive. But again, we just tweaked it. Things we thought would sell in Perth would sell up there, but no, totally different. Again, it's just learning what the customer base wants and um, 
and then purchasing the vehicle to tow it. I looked high and low for a second-hand one, but that's when Ryan jumped in again after doing our homework because we searched all around Australia for a prime mover. And, um, you know, they all had 800,000 to a million kilometres on and, and for an extra 70,000, I could buy a brand new one. So Ryan made the decision for me. He said, Dad, just go buy a new one. And he was spot on. And especially at night when we travelled, it was, um, you know, doing five, 600 kilometres a night through the night. No one around, something goes wrong, you're it. So, yeah, over time, again, from experiences, you take lots of spares and mm. what you haven't got this time, you bring next time. And it was a good ten or nine years we did that. I always reckon you're... Your life planned out for you, and um, I've said this recently to a couple of uh, ex butchers. Um, they've, we've, I had one one ring me last week. He's looking at selling. He's got a business for sale, and um, mm. I said, uh, "Mate, you know, I reckon your life's planned, and mm. your life changes every ten years." And so for me, that that has been the pattern in the in the working life so far for me. Yeah, a bit of a firm believer in that. And after talking to me mate last week. When I sort of explained it a bit, he said, yeah, you're right. Yes. And what he's trying to sell, he's been there nine years, nearly close to that 10-year mark. But, um, yeah, it's a, a chapter in your life and uh, a good chapter. Um, yeah, I always had this dream. So that got me to owning my own my own big truck. Yeah, it's sort of a childhood dream. Originally wanting to be a diesel mechanic to one day own my own truck for what I was going to do, I had no idea, but um, ended up becoming a butcher. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, when you just said earlier when you decided to walk out of your shop yeah you know, a lot of people said to me why why did you stop doing it well well so far um i you know my, personally myself been in business for 23 years and it's full on and you know an old partner of mine said like you, you're married to it which is is a fair call um you give it you give it your all and uh yeah i just i just i just wanted to have a break from um being in business and in regards to the actual uh, uh mobile shop where we we're cutting the meat uh, and getting prepped, they wanted to. It was an old uh, uh, supermarket meat room, but it, it worked really well for us, and it was um, a great setup. You know, just the way it was set out, usable, friendly, and everything. They decided to turn it into a um, childcare centre. I thought, oh gee, here we go. I've got to find somewhere else to prepare the meats. And over here in the west, it's pretty hard to find a food service meat room. They're like hen's teeth. And then I thought, oh, do I want to go down that path again and start all over again and do that? Even though we had a, a, a massive customer base that we created up north. And then, like you just said, we started from nothing and um, created a lot of, I'll call them friends, um, especially country folk. They're, they're always friendly and open and, you know, over the journey, they said, oh, do you need a car, you know, to run into town or, you know, come around for a barbecue or, you know, do you need a shower tonight? Whatever. And then we, when we told them, you know, this next trip's going to be our last, they were, they were absolutely gutted. Yeah. But things come, things go. I was hoping someone would take it on. Yeah, it, you know, it was a good business. Uh, it would have been great for someone to take it on as a different venture. But uh, So that didn't happen. So, um, yeah, I just sold the truck and got the trailer for sale now. Had a couple of look, lookers at it, but, yeah, it's disappointing. It's just sitting there. Um, it'd be great for someone right now with this COVID thing and the more, the more personal touch. Um, being in business with, with customers um, and something unique that someone could be using and it's just sitting there. So it is what it is. Yeah. You know? um, yeah, good part of the life. Well, you never know, mate. There might be someone out there listening today thinking, oh, well, that sounds like it could be fun. Like like you said, it's a lifestyle. So, you know, you never know. Someone might be in contact with a little bit of luck if they're, if they're thinking of doing something like that. So something different. Oh, yeah. No, pretty... Um, and uh, Graham, my, my main butcher I had with me, he um, he worked previously for me at um, Star of the North. He's a dead ringer for um, David Boone, the cricketer. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so that, that's his nickname, Booney. Can he drink as much as Booney? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I, I approached him, um, and then he had his own business and then gave that up, and then I approached him because I just knew that he was the right person, the right fit to be on the road with me. Mm. And he was with me and from day dot and treated it like his own. And, yeah, yeah, just some of the experiences we had, as you said earlier, you know, some of the people that you meet in these different little remote communities are oh, some real characters and really appreciated yourselves and what you were doing for the towns. Um, yeah, we'll never forget it. You know, we were, um, we're still in touch with a few people, actually, um, funny enough. Yeah, yeah it's a, it was a good 
a good time. Yeah. So, so to get ready for a trip to head off, what you know, what was involved? How long did it take you to 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 cuddle the meat up? Was it just a couple of days, two or three days, four days? Because we we're on a month cycle, uh, we went every month. We didn't not go in January, like you know, a lot of places wind down in January. We just thought, no, we'll keep the service up. We were on a schedule um, over a month cycle, so. It was basically the, the first two weeks of the month we would um, prepare the meats and we wouldn't, we don't work weekends, so we're Monday to Friday. So towards the end of the second week, that's when we do all, all our pricing with, um, you know, um, best before codes and all that. So we would get maximum uh, shelf life at the end of the second week. And then uh, we'd load the truck on, on the Sunday, the start of the um, third week, and we, we'd be on the road, leave Sunday afternoon, and then we'd be on the road that whole next week and get back the fo- uh, the Monday of the, the fourth week of the month, a Monday night, and then we'd um, have that week off. So it was basically prep two weeks, a week away, and then have a week off, and then start the cycle again um, every month. So like everything, efficiencies. I'm, I'm always one for efficiencies. Even now with, in this transport game, I'm, I feel like an apprentice again, you know, starting a whole new industry of, um, in the transport and logistics. But it's the same old stuff. Our, us butchers, we're all pretty sensible, level-headed. I suppose there's a few more words you could throw in there of um, just keeping it simple, you know, all that jazz. It doesn't matter what, what you're doing in any industry. I think that's what I'm learning right now in this transport game. Yeah, you know, just keep it simple. And like Ryan set up, you know, as an example of that, over the course of the month with how do we do the trip and all that, we wouldn't take orders via email because Larry and the butchers would busy enough so it was either just and my phone's with me 24 7 so either text me your order or just phone me pretty basic but it worked no occasion we got this oh i gave an email about this order and i said well we're on the road and we're in regions of wa where there's no phone contact so that is the reason so again you're structuring it the way you see it working and simple for yourself rather than getting too entwined in uh, technology a real technology person but that's why i got my little helper over here but it's just keeping it simple you know in business mm. on the yeah, how did we prep it everything had to be vacuum sealed in some way through the health department they were really good to deal with you know um funny enough my my place of uh, work was it's still in the city of june Lup where carambine shop was so we still had the same environmental health officer she went into bat with me which was a godsend really because we had to get a permit through every um shire up up in the pilbara yeah um which could be very complex but you know we were dealing with six different shires up there to get six different permits so helen went into bat for me just to tick of approval for the whole trailer Mm -hmm. that it was you know um at the um the level of what was required for the food service yeah so we were sort of medium risk because we didn't um you know cook pies and all that stuff it was all brought in and vacuum sealed so um Again, it's just keeping it simple. And, um, and I kept it like that basically right through the whole um, structure of setting it up. And the, the reason for that, I think, is because I've been on such a schedule. And I met a guy in Onslow on one of my first three trips we did. And he was the guy that owned the fish truck. And um, he was another one that set things in concrete for me. He's an old Italian guy. And uh, I sat with him and I... He said, I walked in and he didn't know me from a bar of soap and uh, he said, what can I do for you? And I said, oh, I'm looking at setting up a, a meat truck. So he said, come and have a seat. Shook hands and I sat with him for three hours and we just talked. And two things he said to me and he pointed his finger at me. He said, I'll tell you two things. He said, don't you forget them, like real hard case. He said, you buy the best generator you can buy, you make sure you're consistent. And what he meant by that is, if you're so, you say you're going to be in Onslow tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning, you make sure you be there. So them two things were just got implanted in the back of my head right from day dot before we even did a trip. He was spot on, you know, um, you say you're gonna be there, or like a butcher shop of today, if you reckon you're gonna be open at eight o'clock, we'll be open at eight o'clock, ready to, ready to go. Um, same principles. Yeah, and, and the, the other thing was the generator, which was, being on the road with the truck, it was like the heart of the whole operation, which generated the power um, for all the fridge units, like the compressors for the fridge units, the air conditioners, the till, FPOS, backpack machine, 
lighting, you know, all the above. So, um, and yeah, that was that was a bulletproof one, proven over many years. So I bought that one. Yeah, awesome stuff, mate. When you said you had, you had your vac machine, so you were actually able to do all the pre-pack stuff in the shop, it's in the truck itself. So if you ran out of product, you you kept whole product there. You'd slice it up. And you'd be able to put it out there on the shelves, like with it, like just re- basically restock. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, Graham, this is where Graham come in handy. You know, we used to sort of take notes of you know we might have marinated T-bones and we do a hundred of them and and we sold out. You know, and we still got two big days to go. So next trip we will do. 125 just control your stock and we had uh, over time you know a lot of butchers used to say to me oh what do you do with the stuff you bring back but we um we created three different meat packs which uh, you know again it's listening to your customers in the early days we didn't do packs and uh, everyone coming on board saying oh have you got a meat pack have you got a meat pack after we've traded and we drive them back to perth we just talk about different things and graham said oh i think we should start doing some meat packs so then we created those, which, you know, if, once I got back to Perth and did my PLU report, you know, you look up the three different packs and the, the, the volume of those at the different pricing um, was, you know, probably a third of the turnover, you know, for, for that trip. So that was a good idea, which stuff come back, we put into the packs so you could um, you can control your stock levels. But with the little backpack on board, you know, bounce along the road at night over cattle grids, down floodways, Things would move in the back of that truck trailer. You think, how the hell did that come off there? Or why is that sitting over there now? Because it's got it's bounced across the blinking yep. floor at night driving. Um, and then some of the vacuum packs would, um, you know, they blow the bag. So we would, um, the boys, the next day would go through the whole uh, cabinet and just revac anything that was broken. Mm. Yeah, we, uh, over time we just we had it down to a fine art, as you would like in a shop. You know, after owning it, say five years. Mm. You've got it down pat, but you introduce new things and how we can do things better. So towards the end there, we actually, I set up a little um, click-on stand at the rear of the trailer with a sunshade, and um, we did some cooking out, out under the sunshade, doing some sampling and um, got some um, uh, disabled kids in Karatha to come down and, uh, you know, do the cooking and serve it to the, um, the public, which was a good community thing. We used to support quite a bit. Um, with the schools and that's a good one for the butchers out there if you really want to you know create some new customers just find your local schools because all the mums go to school and all the mums talk so if it's pretty butcher in one of the shops down around the corner um mm. you know i'll go see that butcher you know he's um you know, he's a likable lad and you know he's a good looker or whatever yeah next thing you know you yeah you just but yeah getting into the schools um yeah and then maybe sponsoring a you know the the sports day or disco night or whatever um that's a good uh, a good start because there's such a volume of people there you know there's schools everywhere yeah yeah as we know a lot of butchers say they, they support their local communities you know they the local schools sporting clubs you know or all to all types so you know, a, lot, a lot of butchers do that and they get a they get a reasonable return out of it too because the customers always you know they they all talk like you said they all talk and yeah he might be good looking rooster like we were once many years ago larry but um you know yes, no, yes. <laughs> but yeah it's definitely true what you said yeah look mate it's been great chatting with you uh good good to get a bit of an insight into what you've done um and especially the uh the, the mobile butcher part you know it's a whole different spin on the mobile butcher isn't it most you know we don't often hear about uh stories like yours and uh traveling so far and and it's sort of sort of people that you're meeting up with and, and how you actually managed it it's uh, you know i know you know for, for a lot of a lot of the people that listen to these podcasts we we get we got quite a few in the us and the uk and that's 47 degrees celsius not fahrenheit by the way so you do the math you, you yeah it's it's a it's a pretty warm day out there yes Yes, but mate, look, great, great to catch up with you, mate. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to um, wrap it up here and uh, let you get on with the rest of your day. You've had a big day in the truck, so it's getting, uh, it's getting a bit later in your day. So you'd be just about ready to hit the kip, wouldn't you? Oh no, I had a good sleep. I worked through the night, and um, I go down to Southwest delivering, and I stay overnight. I don't rush back. So 
Yeah, I'm all kitted up in the truck. Oh, yeah. Okay, I've got a comfy bed, so um, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, did me rest and do. I'm back there again tomorrow night now, but uh, no, nah, it's all good. All right, You've got to enjoy what you do. Exactly, exactly. No, very good. Mate. All right, mate. Well, well, I look forward to catching up you the next time I'm over in WA. I'll let you know when I'm heading there and um, catch up and have a, have, a, have a beer or two. Yeah, most welcome. Anytime. Thanks a lot, Larry. We'll catch you soon, mate. All the best.